Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and The Rise of Skywalker takes a page from the Avengers Endgame playbook in the way the film prioritizes, above all else, nostalgia, callbacks, the dualistic harmony that George Lucas thinks is poetry. It's as if this film was made for nerds like us to pull apart and savor like a nephew's gingerbread house. Oh no, Santa must have been real hungry. Let's break down Star Wars Episode 9, scene by scene, for all the Easter eggs and deeper symbolism that you might have overlooked, and complete my collection of breakdowns of every Star Wars installment. <laughs> Spoiler warning if you have not seen the film yet. Here we go. The opening crawl declares the dead speak exclamation point. A callback to Revenge of the Sith opening with war exclamation point. And in a sense, the first of many meta commentaries in The Rise of Skywalker that the lessons of The Last Jedi are worth re-examining. That film urged us to let the past die. And in this film, the past roars back with a vengeance. The opening text describes Palpatine as the Phantom Emperor, because as we saw in our episode one breakdown, the Phantom Menace of this entire series has been Palpatine. Actually, the Palpatine recordings that are mentioned in this prologue can actually be heard in the game Fortnite. At last, the work of generations is complete. The great error is corrected. The day of victory is at hand. The day of revenge. The day of the Sith. Biggest crossover of all time. We open on Kylo Ren, wrecking soldiers in a forest of fire as he searches for a Sith Wayfinder, a pyramid-shaped compass used to find the Sith home world. Their shape actually matches the Sith holocron. Kylo arrives at the Sith Temple on Exegol, which is lined with enormous Sith statues, similar to the ancient Jedi statues in the ruins of Jeddah on Rogue One. Unlike those, these statues are still standing, reflecting how the Sith are still very much alive. Kylo hears a voice of Palpatine. At last, my boy. I have been every voice you have ever heard inside your head. <laughs> mm, another key retcon here. Andy Serkis returns as Snoke. James Earl Jones returns as Darth Vader, which dissolve into Ian McDiarmid as the Emperor, who reveals that it was he who posed as the mentor influences in Kylo's head all this time. All this time? Kylo passes pods containing what look like Snoke clones suggesting that Snoke might have been genetically engineered. Palpatine's voice says, The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. It's echoing the same exact words he used in Revenge of the Sith when telling Anakin the story of his old master, Darth Plagueis the Wise, and the secrets of immortality. Flashes of lightning illuminate Palpatine, resurrected. His appearance is undercooked. He's hanging from a life support rigging, bony finger stubs, no pupils, eyes milky white. He's monstrous, something out of a horror film like The Evil Dead. The Snoke clones plus the Plagueis scene callback suggests that Palpatine has returned using a combination of genetic engineering and Sith immortality. But I'm actually doing another video explaining all things Palpatine. So Palpatine reveals what was once the First Order will now be the Final Order. The origin of the First Order was actually revealed in the book Aftermath, Empire's End, in which the Imperial Star Destroyer, the Eclipse, retreated from the Battle of Jakku into the unknown regions with Grand Admiral Sloan and General Hux planning to train child soldiers to rebuild the Empire, saying that that will be their first order. But now that name is revealed to set up this final order, which echoes Hitler's final solution in World War II, in which it was decided that European Jews and other groups that the Nazis considered undesirable would be exterminated. Palpatine's plan of everybody gets a Death Star is the same kind of unspeakably inhumane extermination. Then on the Millennium Falcon, Poe, Finn, and Chewie play hollow chess. And Poe says Chewie's like 250 years old. Technically, Chewie's about 235 years old. He was born in 200 BBY, and The Rise of Skywalker is set in 35 ABY. They are joined by Claude, a new character played by Nick Kellington, who also played Biston in Rogue One. They get intel that was passed from a First Order spy, and they outrun TIE fighters with Poe piloting, and then in the gunner seat paralleling their escape in The Force Awakens, and they light speed skip from planet to planet, a further step of the hyperspace jump within an atmosphere introduced in The Force Awakens, and they're nearly swallowed by a giant slug similar to the Exogoth in Empire. Rey trains on the jungle planet of Agent Kloss with rocks orbiting her, like the rocks she levitated in The Last Jedi, and she chants, be with me. But she's unable to connect with the ghosts of the Jedi past because it's not the end of the movie yet. She trains with a combat remote droid and a blast shield helmet, just as Luke did in A New Hope, but Kylo's meditation with Vader's mask disrupts her concentration, sends her into a flashback to her Force dream. And now, frustrated, she attacks a droid with her saber, and failing that, she crushes it with her weapon of choice, her old bow staff 
a reflection of the classic nature versus technology theme that we saw in Return of the Jedi. The Resistance soldiers include a Mon Calamari named Aftab, and Poe actually calls him Junior in the scene. The Rise of Skywalker prelude comic revealed that Aftab is actually Admiral Akbar's son. Yep, Akbar f As I'm sure he told his wife, wearing condoms is a trap! And he's actually voiced by the movie's co-screenwriter Chris Terrio. Dominic Monaghan joins the cast as Beaumont, and also returning are Greg Grunberg as Snap Wexley, Nia Numb, and Rose Tico, who still wears that medallion necklace that she shared with her sister. The late Carrie Fisher returns as Leia, now called Master by Rey as she undergoes Jedi training. So J.J. Abrams rotoscoped archive footage of Fisher onto a stand-in, repurposing deleted dialogue from previous films. Never underestimate a droid. Rey's Jedi training also comes from reading the ancient Jedi texts that she swiped from Luke's home in The Last Jedi. Kylo Ren reforges the broken shards of his mask, and now the fused cracks resemble the Japanese pottery art of Kintsugi, in which fractured pottery is reassembled with gold or other adhesives, reflecting the philosophy that nothing is ever truly broken, and can take on a new beauty in its repair, reflecting the redemption of Ben Solo's soul in this film. In a meeting with the First Order High Command, one dissenting general mocks the cult mentality the Sith, calling them conjurers and soothsayers, obviously echoing the great Admiral Mahdi of the first film. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes. And Kylo handles criticism even worse than his grandpa did. Joining the cast is Richard E. Grant as General Enric Pride. Grant previously played the villain in Logan, and he modeled his performance here on Peter Cushing as Grand Moff Tarkin. The heroes head to the desert planet of Pasana, shot in real life Jordan. They find the Aki Aki tribe in their celebration of life, which 3PO explains every 42 years, and that number is a nod to the release of the original Star Wars, which was 42 years ago in 1977. Or if you're one of those nerds, 42 is also, I guess, the number from Hitchhiker's Guide books. Oh, 42, it's definitely Douglas Adams. In this festival, Rey sees a puppet show with a character throwing something onto a bonfire, foreshadowing Rey later in the film on Notch 2. A young Aki Aki gives Rey a yellow beaded necklace and asks her what her name is, and is a real stickler, Aki Aki, and asks her last name too. And this brings up the deeper theme of the as a Skywalker. Identity. Rey is told in this film, never be afraid of who you are, and over and over again she is asked who she is. Rey's conflict in this film is to fight the identity she was born with, with the identity she chooses for herself. Kylo connects with Rey in another Force Time chat, like the ones we saw in The Last Jedi, and he snatches the yellow necklace, teleporting it through the Force to determine their location. Now, this is a key device in The Rise of Skywalker, and this device is color-coded. The three films of the modern trilogy follow a pattern of yellow, red, then blue. The Force Awakens has a mostly yellow palette, The Last Jedi is known for distinctive red imagery, and The Rise of Skywalker is a very blue film. J.J. Abrams follows that pattern here. Kylo Force times the yellow necklace. In Act 2, Rey spills the red grain from Kijimi in to Kylo's chamber, and so in Act 3, we're gonna be looking for a blue object that's gonna get teleported, of course, Luke's blue lightsaber. So they run into Lando Calrissian, with Billy D. Williams returning for the role. He's disguised when they first find him, as he was, not too well, in Return of the Jedi. He explains that he and Luke once together try to follow the footsteps of a Jedi killer named Ochi, a bastoon in the Forbidden Desert. Lando says that there are only two Sith Wayfinders remaining, reflecting the classic Sith rule of two, if you think about it. Later, Kylo shatters one of those Wayfinders, foreshadowing his coming break from the Sith Order. TIE fighters arrive, Lando drops the trademark line, I have a bad feeling about this, and he tells Tells Rey, give Leia my love, a callback to his hots for her in The Empire Strikes Back. Well, actually, we learn in Solo that Lando has hots for everything, humans and droids. Finn asks Poe how he knows how to hotwire the skiff, setting up another identity-themed subplot for Poe, his past revealed as a spice runner, spice being the inner universe term for drugs, and so a drug runner. Later, he snaps at Finn and Rey, you used to be a stormtrooper, you used to be a scavenger, we can do this all day, a humorous statement of the theme, that one's past does not have to define one's future. They flee stormtroopers on the skiff, they fly now! They fly now? They fly now! Now, we have seen stormtroopers have thruster packs in the games, first time in the films. BB-8 throws them off with an exploding canister, and Rey repeats Leia's never underestimated droid, also setting up how pivotal 3PO will be to this story. And they get swallowed by quicksand, echoing the Death Star trash compactor scene. But like Super Mario Bros. 3, the quicksand drops into a cave. Poe speaks for kids everywhere by lighting his flashlight like a lightsaber. Yeah, we've all been there, Poe. And he cuts off 3PO by saying he does not want to know what made the cave, which is kind of another way of saying never tell me the odds. And they find Ochi Skeleton 
skeleton, as well as his Sith dagger, which, like the first time Rey touched Luke's lightsaber, triggers a nightmare sequence, but this time it shows her on the Sith throne. A sick, metal-looking throne based on the designs by Ralph McQuarrie for the original trilogy. Now, 3PO is unable to read aloud the translation of the Sith runic language on the dagger. He cites a law passed by the Senate forbidding droids from speaking that language. Now, it's worth pointing out that the Senate was controlled by Palpatine. I am the Senate. So there's a chance that he pushed through that law to keep Exegol hidden. There's a Star Wars Rebels episode, Twilight of the Apprentice, where Ahsoka Tano is actually required to translate the old tongue, which is probably this language. They encounter a giant sand snake beast, which Rey teams by force healing its wound. This ability was actually introduced into the Star Wars canon by Baby Yoda in this week's episode of The Mandalorian. And I will say it again, really would have come in handy with Qui-Gon. Outside, they run into the Knights of Ren and Kylo, who faces down Rey in his new TIE Whisper. Their Matador showdown begins as a Western duel with Rey framed in the classic gunslinger pose, but then Rey turns and runs along the same vector as Kylo. So the shootout has become something closer to a relay race. Rey gracefully leaps and slashes off the ship's wing, but the blocking can also be interpreted as the passing of a baton in a relay race, foreshadowing how Rey will pass off this baton lightsaber to Ben in the final act. Fearing Chewie was taken on the First Order transport, Rey force pulls it back and ends up in a tug of war with Kylo, which ends with her accidentally using Sith lightning to destroy the transport. Little detail, right before she uses that lightning, Rey grits her teeth briefly, making the expression of the Emperor. So as they mourn what they think was Chewbacca's death, Rey realizes that Ochi's ship is the same one from her memory of being abandoned on Jakku as a Girl. On the ship is the droid D.O. who speaks garbled basic and is voiced by J.J. Abrams himself. They head to Kijimi, where they meet up with Poe's former Spice Runner contact Zori Bliss, played by Carrie Russell. They snoop past stormtroopers in a bar that features composer John Williams cameoing as the bartender. His name is Oma Tress, an anagram for Maestro. They head into the droid shop of Babu Frick, voiced by Shirley Henderson, aka Moni Myrtle from the Harry Potter films. And in the background of the shop is a battle droid from the prequel films and the legs of a super battle droid. In order to hack 3PO's inner computer, they have to wipe his memory, making this the second time 3PO gets his memory wiped following Bail Organa wiping him at the end of Revenge of the Sith. And they tell 3PO, you know the odds better than anyone, another never tell me the odds callback. Vabu reboots him and 3PO's eyes glow red as he translates the Sith dagger, directing them to a moon of the Endor system. And as they leave, 3PO shrieks, this is madness, a callback to the first spoken line of the Star Wars films. This is madness. But before we continue, thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. And with them, you get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you gotta do is cook and enjoy. I'm not much of a chef. To be honest, most of my meals come from drive-thru windows. But HelloFresh makes cooking so simple with their step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, it's also affordable. HelloFresh is now from $5.66 per serving. That's cheaper than fast food. I recently cooked the HelloFresh meal Tuscan sausage and pepper spaghetti. The ingredients were fresh, the directions straightforward and easy to follow, even as someone who suddenly gets like baby hands and he cooks. The meal actually tasted really great. I never realized how much you could spice up a simple familiar dish with interesting seasoning and fresh ingredients and just like trying uh, going off of a recipe that some other expert made for you. Their meals are really delicious with more five-star rated recipes than any other meal kit service. HelloFresh offers flexible plans that fit your lifestyle. Easily change your delivery days or food preferences and skip a week whenever you like. Get started with nine free meals. That's $90 off your first month of HelloFresh, including shipping. Just go to HelloFresh.com and enter NewRockStars9. Again, that's HelloFresh.com and enter code NewRockStars9 for nine free meals. So they use Zori's First Order Captain's Medallion to sneak onto the commander ship, and there's a moment when Kylo silences Hux by sticking his finger in his face. The same exact gesture his father, Han Solo, made to Leia when she was at a loss for words on Hoth and Empire. They get past a few stormtroopers with a Jedi mind trick by Rey. Now I'm not sure, but these two might be cameos by Ed Sheeran and Harry Styles, who do play two of the stormtroopers somewhere in the film. Rey goes to Kylo's chamber to retrieve the dagger, and there she gets in a second force time with Kylo. And their duel shatters Kylo's pedestal, holding Vader's mask, a pedestal that appears to be made of obsidian, suggesting that he may have retrieved it from Vader's old castle on Mustafar. General Hux frees Poe, Finn, and Chewie, revealing himself as a First Order spy, who simply just wanted Kylo Ren to fail so that he could probably ascend and Kylo confronts Rey for real this time in a hangar bay, revealing the shocking truth of Rey's parentage. That Rey 
is Palpatine's granddaughter. A flashback sequence shows Rey's parents, played by Billy Howell and Jodie Comer from Killing Eve, and we're never told really about the circumstances of the birth of Palpatine's son, like whether there was a mother, or if he was genetically engineered, or conceived via midichlorian manipulation, like the non-canonical backstory of Anakin Skywalker, but Palpatine's son turned on him and hid his daughter Rey on Jakku, before Ochi found both the parents and killed them. Kylo tells Rey that they are a dyad in the Force, two sides that are meant to join and balance each other, and he offers Rey the opportunity to overthrow Palpatine and take the throne together, echoing the offer that Anakin made to Padme in Revenge of the Sith. And together you and I can rule the galaxy. Make things the way we want them to be. But Rey refuses and leaves with the others on the Falcon, telling Finn that she wants to find Palpatine and kill him herself. So they head to the Endor system, not the same forest moon of Endor where the Ewoks live, but another nearby moon where the wreckage of the second Death Star landed after its explosion. The production design of this wreckage is fantastic, and I love how the Death Star ruins are so massive that they clearly affect the ecosystem of this coastline, bottlenecking all the waves to create a violent storm surge. Like the people of the wars past, the corpses of the machines continue to infect this universe with death. Rey uses an extension from the dagger's hilt to eyeball the location of the Wayfinder among the ruins, similar I guess to the Goonies, finding One-Eyed Willie's treasure. Yeah, it's kinda goofy, but hey, I kinda enjoy the pirate adventure vibe of this film. Here they meet Janna, played by Naomi Aki. Like Finn, she's a First Order defector with no memory of her childhood, since the First Order kidnaps its soldiers as children. She mocks Poe's crash landings, and he says, I've seen worse. He's calling back his crash landing of the TIE Fighter on Jakku in The Force Awakens. And yes, that was definitely worse. Rey takes the skimmer into the submerged ruins of the Death Star, inspired by scrapped concept art for earlier films that I'm so glad they found a place for, because this setting is sick. There are rusting TIE fighters and stormtrooper helmets and armor discarded, suggesting some dark fate for these soldiers, where either they abandoned their armor and tried to swim for it, or maybe they died and their corpses rotted out of their armor. Rey scales the innards of this battle station, similar to how we first saw her in the crashed Star Destroyer on Jakku. The column she climbs is a reactor for the tracking beam just like the one on the first Death Star that Obi-Wan shut down. She enters the throne room, and the music in this moment is the same creepy high notes that John Williams used during Vader's unmasking and death in Return of the Jedi, foreshadowing how at the end of the sequence, Vader's grandson will experience a similar transformation. Now, despite all the dilapidation, the observation window is still intact. In my analysis of episode six, I pointed out how its design was based on a spider's web. In the same way that spider webs can withstand storms and damage, Palpatine's web remains poised to trap his prey. Rey finds the Wayfinder in this Sith chamber, encountering an evil reflection of herself with a Maul-style dual-wield lightsaber, an image that Rey can almost relate with since she naturally prefers her bow staff to a sword. Like in the Sith cave in The Last Jedi, the dark side knows that taunting Rey with her own reflection is the best way to exploit her identity crisis. As she battles her doppelganger, the red blades fold closed around her blue blade, biting them like a pincer, and Evil Rey's face briefly transforms into a Sidious-like monster, similar to the Bilbo jump scare in Fellowship of the Ring. And this leads to the best duel of the trilogy. Rey and Kylo on the wall of the Death Star Trench, waves crashing around them, an elemental inverse of the lava crashing around Anakin and Obi-Wan in Revenge of the Sith. The visual details here are so well refined. You can see the steam sizzling off their blades as water pours over them. And behind them, the turbo laser is streaked with rust like an old battleship. In every possible way, these two are fighting the wars of generations past. Wars that, they realize at the end of this duel, they no longer need to wage. Blow after blow, Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver heave with exhaustion. Each strike is punctuated by John Williams' orchestra as if being desperately urged on by the the ghosts of the past. And the duel ends not because either Rey or Kylo has defeated the other, but because one of those old ghosts interferes. Leia. Holding the rebel medallion she gave Han in A New Hope, Leia surrenders her strength to connect with her son, and Rey exploits this hesitation to stab Kylo with his own blade, feeling immediate guilt. And notice how the moment this fight ends, the rain stops, the waves settle. It's as if the wars of the past give way to common ground of the present. And Rey force heals Kylo's wound. Together, Rey and Leia help Kylo feel love and empathy for the first time in his adulthood and revert him to Ben Solo. Helping Ben process this is a projected memory of Han. And I love the detail that while Ben is soaking wet, Han is completely dry. Or maybe Harrison Ford just growled at the PA with the hose. Don't point that shit at me. The father-son reunion is a beat-for-beat -beat replay of Han's death in The Force Awakens. Ben lifts his hilt saying, I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. And Han touches his face lovingly and Ben finally whimpers, Dad. A huge concession for a loner who previously had no father. And hearing this subtextual I love you, Han responds the perfect way I know. I love you. I know.
Once Ben tosses his lightsaber, Palpatine rallies with general pride, and he refers to Leia as the Princess of Alderaan. It's interesting how Palpatine describes her as she was in A New Hope, not as Kylo's mother, or Vader's daughter, or General Organa. It might reflect Palpatine's frustration with his own family tree, how direct offspring can sometimes be rebellious, disowned disappointments that make it harder for the grandparents to course correct the family legacy. So Palpatine disowns Leia from Vader's legacy as he disowns his son from his own legacy, which he plans to skip the generation and continue with Rey. So they blow up Kijimi, and Rey returns to Ach 2, and Porgs watch as she prepares to follow in Luke's cynical footsteps, but Luke's force ghost stops her from chucking his lightsaber, saying a Jedi's weapon deserves more respect, another meta antithesis from The Last Jedi. Luke counsels her the same way that Obi-Wan's ghost counseled him in Return of the Jedi, revealing a lightsaber previously owned by Leia, and a flashback of the two of them training as Jedi in a forest location, maybe it's Endor, maybe it's Yavin 4, and they use archive footage of Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher's younger appearances here. And Luke raises his submerged X-Wing from the water, as Yoda did on Dagobah and Empire, with John Williams' score blasting the same Yoda theme. And with Luke's X-Wing and Kylo's Wayfinder, Rey guides a resistance to Exegol using Luke's famous Red 5 signal. And as a resistance prepares to strike, they mention a Holdo maneuver, referring to Holdo's kamikaze hyperspace strike on the Supremacy in The Last Jedi. Later in the celebration montage, the Star Destroyer that the Ewoks see appears to have been split with a Holdo maneuver. As resistance takes off along with the Tantive 4, or maybe just another CR-90 Corvette, Lieutenant Connix, played by Billy Lord, Carrie Fisher's real-life daughter, wears a similar costume as Leia wore in the final battle of Return of the Jedi with a camo poncho and the single braid bun. Onto the final battle of Exegol. When Rey enters the Sith Temple, she hears the chanting of Sith Pass, which acoustically echoes the sound design of the chanting Ghosts from the Shining. Rey finds Palpatine, who makes the same case to her that he made to Luke in Return of the Jedi, goading her into striking him down and tempting her by showing her fleet losing the battle. She seems to give in, and he says, Good. Good. McDermott also drops a real solid, do it, do it. It's like he's seen the memes. And as they did in The Last Jedi, Rey and Ben join forces, and Palpatine absorbs some of their life force to, like, mummy back his flesh and walk again. When he does, his eyes reacquire the yellow irises that he gained during his transformation in Revenge of the Sith. Palpatine uses this surge in power to unleash Sith lightning on the Rissa's distant fleet, creating an all-is-lost moment for Poe. Snap dies. <sighs> but then. Lando returns in the Falcon, wearing his classic yellow shirt, and pretty much every Star Wars ship is in tow here. There's the Ghost from Rebels, the Hammerhead Corvette from Rogue One, the Razor Crest from the Mandalorian, Mon Calamari Cruisers, Han's Freighter from The Force Awakens, the Bombers from The Last Jedi, Dorian Gunships, the U-Wing from Rogue One, Nebulon B and C frigates, and more that I'm probably missing. Among the returning pilots is <gasps> Wedge Antilles, with Dennis Lawson making a cameo. Zori Bliss also returns to the front, making good on her earlier words to Poe when she told him that they win by making you think you're alone. There's more of us. And one by one, the us's take down each Star Destroyer. Rey, on her back, repeats her be with me prayer and looks up to the heavens and is answered by the voices of Jedi past. If you listen closely, you can hear Luke, along with Yoda, voiced by Frank Oz as always, Hayden Christensen as Anakin, Samuel L. Jackson as Mace Windu, Liam Neeson as Qui-Gon Jinn, Ewan McGregor and Alec Guinness voicing Obi-Wan, Freddie Prince Jr. as Kanan Jarrus, Ashley Eckstein as Ahsoka Tano, Olivia Dabo as Luminara Unduli, Jennifer Hale as Ayla Secura, Angelique Perrin as a voice of Adi Gallia, Jedi Assemble. And with her new strength, Rey rises, summons both Luke's and Leia's blades, and uses them to deflect Palpatine's Sith lightning to tear apart his flesh like a Nazi who opened the Ark of the Covenant. Essentially, what Mace Windu would have done to Palpatine had Anakin not interfered. Ben rises and returns the favor by saving Rey with his own force healing. Revived, she calls him Ben and touches his face, reminding him of the love that he felt from his parents. And they have a smooch. And for the first time ever in this trilogy, Adam Driver smiles. He and Leia fade as these Jedi become one with the Force. In the ensuing celebration, John Williams' Luke and Leia theme plays over a montage of Bespin and Jakku and Endor with a cameo from Warwick Davis as Wicket. The Resistance soldiers include a Bothan, the rebels mentioned by Mon Mothma in Return of the Jedi, and somewhere among them is a cameo by Lynn manuel Miranda. Lando offers to help Janna find a spinoff, and thank god, Maz Kanata hands off Han's rebel medallion to the Wookiee who got snubbed in the first film. I love how in the closing shot of this party, you can see Chewie showing it off to R2 and 3PO. The final scene returns us to Tatooine. Rey passes Jawas in a sand crawler, and she finds the Lars moisture farm. Arm. She sleds down the dune as she did in The Force Awakens, and she buries Luke's and Leia's lightsabers near where Shmi was buried. Rey shows off a new lightsaber she built with a yellow blade, which I speculated in my Indian Explained video that could connect her with the Guardians. Go check that out for more on that. But following the yellow red blue pattern, Rey's return to yellow here could signal a reset, the start of a new adventure. Rey designed the hilt of her lightsaber to resemble her bow staff. 
and its symmetrical design makes me wonder if the bottom is actually a secondary blade. Now, the hilt would probably need to be longer for a practical dual wheel, but hey, she's got small hands, she can make it work. An elderly woman rides by on a Tatooine camel, just like the one Obi-Wan rode up to this farm in the final shot of Revenge of the Sith, but this woman asks who she is, and Rey says Rey, but this is a stickler old camel woman, so she asks Rey who, bringing us back to that theme of identity. Rey could say she's Rey Palpatine and scare the shit out of this woman, but rather than label herself as a Star Wars equivalent of Hitler, Rey looks out and sees mirage-like visions of Luke and Leia's force ghost smiling back at her, and Rey figures it out and responds, Rey, Leia Luke, uh, uh, Rey, ghost siblings, no, oh, no, Rey Skywalker. Rey chooses the identity she fought for so that the Skywalker legacy can live on. A feeling of hope that J.J. Abrams underscores with the final shot, the binary sunset that started this adventure 42 years ago. And so concludes this analysis and Easter egg breakdown of the rise of Skywalker. But we still have more Episode 9 videos in store for you, so be sure to subscribe to New Rockstars and comment down below with your favorite moment from this film. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Boss. Thank you for joining me. Bye.